Hi everyone, and welcome to Indie Geek Live. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the North, which is quite a big topic, but uh, I was wanting to tie this in with where we've got to in the Traveller's Guide, if you've been following along with uh, that series of videos I've been doing. We are reaching the end of the, the Guide to the North. The very last one of my uh, episodes in the North is... Uh, is is going live tomorrow so do check that one out after that we're going to head down into the riverlands but i thought this was a chance just to sort of tie a few things together and i want to make this quite an interactive session quite uh quite a q a session so uh, obviously if there are any super chats as always we'll come to them straight away but i'm going to be looking to uh to, to to get some questions from the chat to be doing that uh, and i've also got a few questions from my patrons uh as always my patrons questions that will get priority so i'll be coming to them as well as we go through so uh guys i wanted to just say uh say hi to everyone out there in the chat i can see there's quite a few people coming through already it's great to see you all um uh now i thought what we would do is we'll just start if if i sort of break this down uh just to sort of in chunks and so if you want to throw questions about those particular areas while i'm going through that would be great first of all i thought we would talk about the wall and the gift and sort of the bit right up at the north of uh, of the uh, of the north and uh we'll sort of gradually move our way down south and end up at the um uh, at the neck uh, before heading down in, into the Riverlands for an, another time. So I thought rather than just reiterating everything I've said in the Traveller's Guide, what I'll do is I'll just sort of pick out a few things that I found particularly interesting in each area, uh, things that I hadn't spotted before or I thought uh, might show us a slightly different angle uh, of than, than we normally see when looking at those areas. And then I'll get into a few questions on each of those uh, different places. So if we start off uh, looking at uh, the the wall uh, and the gift, I think uh, the first thing I would say that I uh, that really struck me about the wall that we don't often think about is I always imagine it as being this straight line going right across the country like that. But it's not. It's if you if you imagine Castle Black in the middle of the wall, and then on one side of it, heading out east to East Watch. Yes, it is straight. But the other side sort of wiggles around in a kind of a snake-like fashion, uh, which was something I'd not really thought about before. But it did remind me of the fact that the wall didn't start as being this massively high uh, thing that we see today. It's got there over millennia. It actually started a, as, uh, we don't know exactly how high, but just like a normal-ish sized wall. And then over each generation, they just added to it and made it higher and bigger and bigger. So we shouldn't think of the wall as being this thing that's been static, that's been there forever in exactly that same uh, shape. It really is a thing which uh, has changed a little bit over time. Um, I think the other things which really uh, struck me are uh, the the way the, where it ends uh, at both ends. We again we think of it as sort of going coast to coast and yes it does end on on the coast at the east but on the west it doesn't it ends slightly inland it ends at the, the gorge uh, which is this huge ravine uh, with a river running down uh, the bottom of it so uh, any way you look at it the wall is not actually meant to be a physical barrier preventing people to coming across it's it's not not just that the, the wildlings habitually go down into the gorge and around the outside of the wall on one side and there are little fishing boats which come out on by east watch on the other side that you can easily just circumvent it so it's not meant to be this physical barrier that sh which it turned into which is preventing any access uh, it really is a magical barrier that has got a physical component to it. So I think that, again, that's just a little thing that uh, that really struck me, is that it's not just about having a physical wall to prevent anyone moving one way or the other. And the other thing, uh, before I get onto a few questions, that I would say uh, about the wall is um, it's really noticeable when I was doing the Traveller's Guide how far the Night's Watch has fallen. There are 19 castles on the wall and only three of them are currently occupied and they are not full. This is 
Uh, this is a massive force that used to be on the wall that is now just a very, very small fraction of what it used to be. And of the people who are there, uh, this is obviously uh, for, taking it from the point at the beginning of the show or the beginning of the books, uh, then actually quite a large proportion of them are not trained fighters and soldiers. They just happen to be people who've been conscripted up there, perhaps taken from the, the cells in King's Landing or wherever. So this is not anything like what it was imagined to be to start with. So the defences to the north are not strong by any stretch of the imagination, even at the very start of, of the books and the show. So those those are the things that really struck me when I was uh, looking at the, the wall. But I'm going to come to uh, a few uh, questions from my uh, patrons, and then I'll just see if, if there's any uh, questions there in the chat. Um, uh, John St. Baptiste, who uh, incidentally, John, I, I remember I was going to give you a shout out if you weren't here beforehand. Uh, John uh, has just, well, I think he's had a channel for a little while, but he started creating original content. And John uh, is one of my patrons, uh, and I'm always on the lookout to support new uh, new creators, uh, small channels, because I can remember exactly what it was like being a really small channel. And uh, you need all the support and all the all the the, the, the chances for people to discover you that you possibly can. So please, uh, I put the link slightly higher up in the chat. Uh, go and check out uh, uh, John uh, John's channel. Um, if there's, there's a link on there, it's John St. Baptiste. If you just Google John St. Baptiste YouTube, you'll get there. And he's got a channel which is looking at music. Uh, he's got some great, uh, I saw a playlist with some great cover uh, bands in there, as well as, uh, a really interesting think piece, just as his first bit of original content. So uh, anyway, but I've got a question from him, um, which is uh, Tyrion says something to the effect that the only difference between the wildlings and everyone else is where they lived when the wall was built. Uh, for the most part, I agree. But then you have rattlebones, cannibal tribes, and so on. The question is, how well, if everything works out, will the wildlings cohese with the rest of Westeros? Will the north of the wall become the Eighth Kingdom? So uh, I think this is a really interesting question. Are they are the wildlings so different to the rest of the, the people in the Seven Kingdoms, the rest of the people in Westeros, that they would not fit, they would not work as being part of the same uh, sort of uh, government structure, as you like? For me, that is the one thing that actually sets them apart. It's not about their culture, I think, that if you look across the north, there's a huge variety of different cultures, and then heading on down, Dawn has got a very different culture to the rest of it. The Iron Islands have got a very different culture. So I don't think it's about the culture. What I think is different and makes it slightly harder is the fact that they, as they say, they do not kneel. They, they recognise, or very rarely recognise, uh, an overall leader or king, and when they do, it's simply for a short period of time, often for a single purpose. So when you get these kings beyond the wall, that's not a, a title that gets passed down and passed down and passed down from generation to generation, like the kings to the south do. That's just a leader comes up, people recognise, and they say, I'm going to follow that person for this period. So for me, that is the thing that might set them apart and prevent them from being a part of the seven or eight kingdoms. Uh, but I think the bigger picture is that I don't think we're going to have the same kind of world after all this has ended that we had before. So I don't think it's just a matter of adding on an extra kingdom to the seven kingdoms. Uh, so I hope that one answers uh, that for you. Um, uh, San Rixian, uh, a super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, $10, that's very kind. And not related to this stream, uh, which is great so far. Keep it up, thank you very much. But thank you for your Westworld recap videos. You're very welcome. Guys, if you don't know, I this is a, uh, Game of Thrones live stream, so I will be sticking to Game of Thrones here, uh, but I also do Westworld content. I've been really excited by this season. I think it's been a fantastic season, and I'm doing uh, both uh, episode explained videos and live streams as well on a Sunday, so please do check them out if you're at all interested in that. So, but thank you, San Rixian. That was very, uh, very kind. Um, Jeffrey Burst, another one of my patrons, uh, put in a question saying uh, about Bran the Builder. 
whether I could delve into his link with magic and how the maesters saw him because of it. Uh, because, of course, the maesters oppose it, but Bran apparently was uh, involved in helping build the high tower. Um, so what's going on there? Well, I, I think the first thing we have to say whenever we're talking about Bran is that Bran is, uh, and George R. R. Martin says this many times in many different ways, he is a mythical, legendary creature, creature person that is so far back in the mists of time that we do not know. We cannot say anything about him categorically. He's he's just like, uh, if you imagine the equivalent of uh, King Arthur, but many, many times more ancient than that, is that we can say, yes, there probably was somebody like that, uh, and probably there's some truth to some of those stories, but we can't we can't say categorically what the truth is. So that's the first thing we have to say whenever we're talking about Bran the Builder. The second thing is that uh, it's not entirely clear from the legends we have that he himself was the magical one. The, the kinds of things, <coughs> pardon me, that he did with the building, it, it seems to be that he uh, was doing it with other people who perhaps might have used magic, like the children of the forest or the giants. So the, the when the wall was built, both of those groups of people apparently were involved as well. It's just that the humans remember Bran the Builder because he was their person, their part of it. So there's no clear indication that he was himself um, a particularly magical person. And... In terms of the link with the maesters, the maesters themselves, again, this is lost in the mist of time, but they were only being set up at around that point. So it wasn't as if they'd um, got this great history as they do now of being uh, very uh, focused in on being anti-magic or disliking magic. Indeed, when they were set up, they included all kinds of knowledge which included magical knowledge they had seers they had uh, magical healers they had all kinds of people were gathered into old town as as a, a a place of applied and learned knowledge not just a place where there was this uh, establishment where you had to go and agree to everything they were so i i think the answer uh, jeff is that it's a lot more complicated um they were only just the, the maesters are only just being set up at the time. They didn't have those kind of entrenched positions that we know them as having now. And everything we understand about uh, Bran is slightly up, up, up in the air and up for uh, questioning. So, uh, if he was magical, then we haven't got categorical evidence, um, and we don't know who might have opposed him. Um, Okay, guys, so I've got one more question here um, uh, from another one of my patrons, and then I shall uh, come into the uh, the chat, see if you've got any other questions here about the wall or the, the gift. I said this was about the wall and the gifts, Crypts of Winterfell, uh, again, another one of my patrons, uh, said maybe you could let us know why they call it the gift. Um Yes, I can. So uh, the gift, for those who don't know it, is that is a strip of land just to the south of the wall that is um it owes its uh i, I can't remember the, the, the technical term but the income from there instead of going to one of the lords one of the great noble houses of the north it goes to support the night's watch at the wall so they would give their tithe or whatever but instead of it going to the Starks or the Car Starks or the Umbers or anyone else, it would go to the Night's Watch. And the idea being that this would give them the income they needed to be independent. They weren't reliant on particular houses or anything like that. They had their independence. Now, this um, started with the, the, um, the top bit of the gift. And I should probably say here that there are two bits. It's generally split in half. The top bit is called Brandon's Gift, and the, the next bit down is called The New Gift. So the top bit was given by one of the Brandons in House Stark, perhaps Bra uh, Bran the Builder, we don't know, perhaps his son. It's not 100% clear, but this was in the establishment 
uh, or there or thereabouts, the establishment of the Night's Watch to, to get that principle in place, that they could be independent and they had their own source of income to buy whatever they needed. The, the second bit, called the New Gift, happened much later. So this was in the time of the Targaryens. We're here with uh, the time of Jaehaerys I, who was quite... Uh, quite a good and wise king. People tended to like him. He did a huge amount of building up of things which were good for the kingdom. He and uh, Queen Alassane or Alison um, uh, visited the wall, and they they tried to support it, and uh, they ordered a new fort to be built. Uh, to allow people to move out, to allow them to move out from the night fort, which was just too big for them. It was just uh, uh, unwieldy. They couldn't manage it anymore. And they decided to give them an extra strip of land, uh, the new gift, to so that they could theoretically get even more income. So this was done out of uh, largesse, out of trying to help the Night's Watch, which is all very good, but at the same time... Uh, the first gift was given by the Starks from their own land. The second was given by the Targaryens from Stark land. So uh, whether that was a fair gift, they obviously couldn't complain because it was the king giving it. But uh, that's why it's called the gift. Uh, and the, 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 the idea is that that supports them. But unfortunately, as time has gone on and the numbers of the Night's Watch have dwindled, this has meant that they've not been able to protect the wall as much, which meant that there were more wildling raids, which meant that more of the farmers who were in the gift abandoned their land, which meant that there was less money for the Night's Watch, which meant that they then couldn't defend the wall as well, and it just has led into this kind of vicious spiral. So there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, problems with that, but that is why uh, it is called the gift. <coughs> Um, okay, let's. Uh, I'm going to quickly uh, get into the chat now, just to see if you've got any. Uh, John, some, that Baptiste, thank you so much. Ten dollars uh, super chat. Let's get this train rolling. Thank you so much. That's very kind, uh, guys. Again, as I said earlier, if do please check um, uh, check out John's um, uh, channel if you can. It's it's well worth having a look, and he's going to be producing more content on, content on there soon. Uh, Talamasca Dan. Uh, says, uh, do you know or think there are castles and keeps and towns well beyond the wall? I, there are certainly settlements beyond the wall, uh, whether they count as castles and keeps. Um, so uh, we know about Hardhome, for example, which was quite a large settlement as a sort of a port. We get we hear of a few other little settlements um, north of the wall that the Knights Watch have. In terms of castles, there are certainly a few left by the first men. So we get, for example, the fist of the first men is probably the biggest and most well-known, but it's clear that there were um, uh, places that we would call fortresses in some way. The fist of the first men, it's, it's shaped like a fist, but it's got fortifications around the top. Uh, so it's making use of the physical geography uh, as a, a fortress. So yes, there are. There are some abandoned ones, but the wildlings seem not to naturally gather together into cities that require some sort of governance because they don't like the idea of all this governance. They want to be free, uh, and so they tend to be in smaller uh, sort of tribes, as, as it were, rather than in larger gatherings like cities. Uh, and uh, they also tend not to have these huge... Uh, castles that we would see south of the wall. So uh, yes, uh, Dan, there are some, but not the same amount that we would get uh, south of the wall. Um, uh, Danielle Marston, uh, five pounds. Thank you so much. Uh, choo choo. Uh, that's uh, that's great. Thank you. Um, uh, th there's uh let's have a quick see uh maura lee hi there maura good to see you uh another one of my patrons do you think the wall had something to do with the night king and the white walkers i wonder if the night king is a stark uh on the second bit about the night king being a stark i agree uh, i think very much he he is uh a stark i think that i well i 
did a, a video about it ages ago called Is the Night King a Stark? And spoiler warning, if you've not w watched it, I think, yes, he is. Um, in terms of the, uh, the first part, is it... Um, do I think that the wall had something to do with the Night King and the White Walkers? Yes, I do. This was not a wall to keep the wildlings out. This was a magical barrier that they added a physical layer to. And the magical barrier is the thing to keep out magically created creatures. So I think that's what has been going on. That's why the wall is there to start with. Um, it, it's only recently that people have been thinking about this as, as wildlings. So, so that's the... Uh, that's the breakdown of what I think has been, why it's there and what's uh, how it sort of slowly changed in people's minds as people forgot about the others, about the White Walkers. Um, uh, Steph is, says, um, has the population of the North dropped significantly in the last few hundred years? We, well... The short answer is we don't know. Um, the population of the wall definitely has. Uh, the The impression I get is that the the population of the northern bit of the north is probably largely static. Now, the the reason why I say that is there are some traditions uh, are based around how you survive in the winter. Now, this is a huge part of, of how people live in the north. And in order to uh, survive the winter, in some cultures up there in the north, uh, the old men just go out to allow people uh, into, the, into the snows, effectively sacrificing themselves so that the areas that they have, uh, warmth and food, can uh, sustain the younger people. Now... That implies to me that the, the castle sizes have not changed significantly. Once you've got stone, yes, stone walls for something, then uh, that sets in place what the size of something is. Uh, so the the population of the north may have increased a little bit, uh, but I don't think it's changed hugely. The bit that it has expanded a lot over the last few hundred years is White Harbour. And White Harbour is the only actual city that there is in the north. Uh, it's by southern standards, it's not a huge city, but it definitely is a city. So that part there has seen a population expansion. The rest of the north, I think, probably is roughly as it was. I don't think it's hugely increased or hugely decreased. So overall, maybe a small net increase. Uh, I hope that one answers there. Um, uh, be one merry starry sky uh, all aboard. Thank you so much. That's very kind uh, uh, for that that super chat. And uh, scripts, clips, series, and flicks. Twenty dollars. Thank you. I'm here a bit late. Uh, happy to make it this time. Uh, really good to see you. Um, I don't know whether you saw. Actually, uh, I did answer your. Uh, question on Patreon uh, uh, just a moment ago. So uh, if you didn't catch that one, uh, uh, scripts, clips, I might just call you scripts, then uh, do uh, check that out. Uh, the second half of your question, I shall answer a little bit later. Um, okay, guys. Um, uh, I think um, I'll take another couple of questions for uh, for thinking about the wall, and then we're going to move on to a few other areas because I think there's a few other areas in in the north that'd be fantastic just to have a, a quick look on. Um, Chris Weinberger uh, Q and A. Do you think that the Night King may turn out not to be the ultimate villain? Maybe someone else, i.e., Cersei, turns out to be the biggest threat to the realm in the end. Um, I think in the books. I think that this is set up that it's not just a, a good guys and bad guys thing. It's not just a who's the ultimate villain. I think every, we will find that every side you can understand. You might not agree with them. You might not think they're good, but you can understand what is motivating them. And the way that George R. R. Martin has set it up is very much based on Robert Frost's uh, uh, Fire and Ice poem, uh, which is very much about two forces being ice and fire, each of which can destroy the world. 
And I think that is one of the messages that in the books it's very clear is that uh, the fire magic we get not just Daenerys and the dragons who uh, she is consistently wanting or, or considering using to, to firebomb in innocent civilians in cities in Westeros, uh, but also uh, people like Melisandre and the Red Priests. This fire magic could burn the world. Similarly, the ice magic could but it frees the world and they both could destroy it. And I think that the story there is about this is how do we stop, balance, push back both of these equally opposing forces that could destroy the world. Um, and that doesn't make the White Walkers the villains. Uh, I think that, that we will understand a lot more about their motivations at some point. Probably won't make us like them much, but it will at least help us understand there. But in terms of on the show, uh, will they be the big bad guys? I think yes, they will still. Uh, I think that that's the way it's going. I think you will find, however, that Cersei's going to hang around for a, quite a while, right up to the the very uh, the very end, as it were. And Euron. Again, in the books, you're a huge character who I think will have a much bigger role to play, but I think that he will probably also turn into one of the sort of the, the bad guys, as it were. We, he is already, but I think that he is going to be one of the people who can uh, who can survive uh, quite near to the end. Uh, uh, okay, guys, I think uh, with that... Um, uh, I'm going to move on slightly further south, so uh, let's... Let's talk about Winterfell for a little bit. Uh, guys, uh, I love Winterfell. <laughs> I think it's an amazing place. This is, uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't get enough of reading about it, of thinking about it, particularly the crypts of Winterfell. Is one of, for me, one of the most uh, intriguing and interesting places in the entire continent. Um, the things when I was looking again at Winterfell uh, for this series that really struck me, um, the first one was a thing which strikes me every time is how it is described in the books as being quite organic. It's it's repeated again and again how this is uh, the the weirwood tree was there first, and then everything kind of grew out of it. And you you get the tunnels through there are tunnels through the walls, the curtain wall of of Winterfell that is described in an almost uh vein like way as if it's sort of running all the way through the the hot water which rushes around uh inside the walls in winterfell keeping it warm is again it's described as like being blood pumped around the building it's it's described as being quite an organic thing not just uh a stone building but something which has grown up and around and out of the weirwood tree. So that was the first thing that I noticed. The second thing uh, is we don't really see it on the show, but it becomes quite apparent that the Starks don't they don't care so much for repairing stuff, uh, which seems quite odd. So there's there's the broken tower, which is um, the massive tower. It used to be the highest tower in Winterfell. There's the old keep. Both of those things are abandoned. There's the bottom of the crypt at Winterfell, which has had a cave in, and they appear not to have dealt with that. Um, and there's this kind of feeling of there's a lot here that uh, they haven't tried to repair or take it back to its former glory. They just sort of left it there, which I don't know what to do with that, but I've noticed going around the rest of the north, this pattern carries on if you look across the, the wall when i said earlier there are 19 castles on the wall 16 of them are abandoned and they're just falling into disrepair down in the neck moat kaelin used to be a huge castle a huge fortress 20 towers there's now only three and they're all about to fall over and it's just been abandoned this is something which appears to be across the piece in the north it's got a feeling of things just being left to drift things just they they they've abandoned them but they they haven't built the new thing yet uh moat kaelin will come to in a moment i'm sure but it just it seems incredible that this 
this huge fortress which is guarding the entrance to the north has been just abandoned and left completely not even maintained to a point where a, a garrison can go in there it's just been left to slowly fall into the bog so that was um uh, that was the second thing that i thought there um uh the third thing which i hadn't perhaps picked up on before but did when i was doing this was winter town now winter town is uh it's just outside the walls of Winterfell, and this at most of the year during the summer months, it is only twenty percent full. It's almost completely empty. It's a complete town of I think it's like twenty thousand people can live there. But come the autumn winter, all of the people from the outlying villages and the hills and the farmers, they then descend around into Winter Town. They take up residence in those houses and it becomes a completely new community and that for me adds a complete different angle on how we view Winterfell not just as a castle but that then suddenly turns it into quite a sizable community as well and I although I'm not sure that they will uh, really cover this on the show but it does make you think what happens if during the winter somebody attacks Winterfell, as presumably is going to happen on the show quite soon, uh, because you've got a whopping great big town outside the city walls. Do they abandon the town and bring everyone inside the city walls? Can Winterfell hold all those extra people? I don't know. Uh, they haven't really covered that on the show. I suspect they probably won't cover it on the show. But in the books, I think they will have to, because George R. R. Martin has made quite a thing of how they're uh, during the winter months, this is a place where so many people gather and go. Okay, uh, those are the uh, the things that I will just pick up on uh, quickly. Um, Osmini Rodriguez, uh, one of my patrons, said, uh, if you were John, where would you make your stand, Winterfell or Moat Kalin? Now, uh, I th I think this is a great question, a really fine question. I was, I was thinking about this for, for a little bit. Um, it, this does depend on where you're defending from. Moat Kalin is uh, built, was built to defend things from the south. That's how it is. It's, it doesn't defend things from the north. It defends things from the south by just having this one road, by being sat on this one road uh, and uh, being able to uh, effectively just uh, pick off anyone who comes down this one road. Um, that at its height of its power, if you were defending from the south, that is definitely where you would do it. But from the north, it's not that useful as a defensive structure. Uh, in terms of Winterfell, uh, if you've seen my videos, uh, I think my, my video on the Horn of Winter and the Crypts of Winterfell sets out probably most clearly my view is that I think Winterfell has been set up as a defensive structure against the army of the dead against the white walkers the others and I think that that therefore is is the reason for it being there I think that the whole idea uh, feel free to watch the, the the video for how I got to this but I think that the horn of winter is intended to wake the stark dead to fight against the others if they get that far. And I think they will rise up out of the uh, Winterfell crypts to fight against the others. I think that is what we've been uh, hearing uh, from all of the hints and the foreshadowing in the books about what's going on in the crypts. So in answer to your question, uh, Osmany, Winterfell, I think if you're they're attacking from the north every single time, it will be at Winterfell. Um, if it's just a normal army coming from the south, it's got to be Moat Kalin. Uh, okay, guys, so I'm just going to have a quick flick through uh, Kelly Morlock agreeing about the Horn of Winter. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, I think that's uh, – uh, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that was – it's entirely my theory that I picked lots of things from lots of other different people as well. So, um, But I think there's a lot to back it up. Uh, Nicola Durakan says, are there any more Children of the Forest left? Um, not at Winterfell. Uh, and – uh, in terms of the north, which is what we're thinking, yes, there obviously were some uh, north of the wall uh, that we knew about. In terms of the north, I think 
it's possible that there might be a couple of hanging around in the depths of the forests. That is where they were in the pact many millennia ago. That is the bits that they were given. If they are anywhere in the north, it's going to be in the neck, which only the, the Kranag men know their ways around. Uh, so uh, if they're anywhere, they're, they're possibly there. Uh, I think it's in terms of south of the wall, the, the place that they were hiding is uh, the Isle of Faces, which is obviously a long way south uh, of where we're looking at today. So are the children of the forest? Yes, I think there are still a few of them hanging around, uh, but they're certainly not in, out in the open. They're, they're very much hidden away somewhere where people do not go. Um uh, Peg Leg Pete says it all depends on the route the Night King uses. Yeah, I think this is quite an, an interesting uh, point as well. So uh, moving on slightly to the the other northern uh, strongholds we've got. A lot of this, where you would depend, defend yourself does depend on where, they, where the Night King is going. What is the Night King's objective? Now, I suspect this again, this might be slightly different in the books and in the show. I think that uh, in the on the show, I think he's probably going to be heading towards King's Landing. He will probably head towards Winterfell first. But in the books, certainly, um, we will find uh, it might even happen off screen on the show. The last half is the obvious first place that, that an army attacking uh, from the north would come to. Uh, so that would get the first brunt of it. Uh, a few places like, for example, the car holds probably actually out of the way, like Deepwood Mott as well. They're kind of out of the way. So why would you attack them? Um, uh, the Winterfell itself, it's just because of its its position there in the middle uh, of being such a huge and prominent castle, unless there's some other motivation for going to Winterfell, which I think there might be. So uh, yes, it depends on where they're going, but I think uh, we will see, uh, in any event, uh, we will hear of the last half falling first, and then they will probably go to Winterfell. Um, why does uh, Devi's asking about Lady Dustin wanting the bones so bad just to stop them from being laid to rest. Uh, these are Ned Stark's bones. Lady Dustin is a book character, not a show character. Um, but there's, uh, and I'm, I won't go into all of it right now, but there's, uh, there's a whole history there. Uh, she uh, bears a grudge against Ned, because if you remember at the uh, Tower of Joy, Ned did not bring the bones of his companions with him back up to the north. He left. He he buried them, or he didn't even bury them. He put he uh, made cairns out of the stones from the Tower of Joy for all of the dead bodies, and he brought Lyanna's body back up, but he left the bodies of his companions there, and one of those companions was a Dustin, uh, Lady Dustin. Uh, as a result, bears a grudge against Ned Stark uh, because he didn't do what she felt he was on about to do. He took a sword back to uh, to um, the um, uh, the Danes, uh, but he didn't bother taking his own bannermen's bones back home. So, yes, actually, on the face of it, Ned wasn't uh, didn't do what he ought to have done, nor did he at any point go back there or order people to go back there to collect those bones. Uh, as a result, she is very keen that Ned's bones themselves do not return back up to Winterfell. So that's what that's what that is. Um, uh, ER uh, says, and this is going slightly off topic from the north, will Euron summon Krakens or even something worse? Yeah, I think uh, I think he he may well summon Krakens. I did a couple of videos on Euron actually uh, quite recently uh, if you want to go check them out. For me, I think in and this is book Euron, not show Euron. Uh, I think he's trying to do two things. First of all, he is trying to bind the dragons to him from across the ocean, uh, and secondly, I think he is wanting to be reborn as a god. That is what he is attempting to do. He's going to make a huge sacrifice in a sea battle, uh, strapping uh, 
priests and uh, his un unborn uh, child uh, uh, to the front of boats uh, and he's going to make a huge sacrifice and hope that at the same time Dragonbinder, uh, the great horn, is blown across the sea uh, and he is also going to try and be reborn as a god. So I think he's got crazy, huge, magnificent plans um, and uh, yes, they may well uh, involve bringing Krakens, but I think that he's got even bigger plans than just bringing forth Krakens. Uh, John St. Baptiste, uh, five dollars. Thank you so much. Lady Warrior has a darn good question. Uh, let me just try and find this. Um, uh, this th is this the one about Danny, maybe Ned and Ashara's baby? Um, uh, yeah, I'm. I, I'm I'm going to do a whole video series on what I think happened at the Tower of Joy in Robert's Rebellion and in that whole series of events there. And I'm going to do that after Westworld series is finished uh, through the summer and into the autumn because I think that this there are lots of different things that we just need to tie together in this. So in terms of uh, Daenerys being Ned and Ashara's baby, my gut instinct now is probably not, uh, for the reason that thematically, as part of the story, I think that she does need to be a Targaryen. She clearly has the kind of the Targaryen powers uh, to bond with the dragons, uh, the the sort of the being okay with um, uh, heat and things like that. So there's a huge amount of Targaryen. Um, powers in there that I do not think that she would have if she came from Ashara Dane and Ned Stark. Ned is is al almost completely uh, from the blood of the first men, from the sort of the northern uh, line. And the Danes, although they have intermarried a little bit, uh, they're not uh, they're not particularly Targaryen. Uh, so I can't see that she would be as Targaryen as she is if she was born of those two people. So that's that's my, my gut instinct there. But that said, what we think about what happened at the Tower of Joy, I think is still incomplete. And I think that there are a few threads that I want to tidy up, uh, which is why I'm going to do a whole series starting actually a little bit further back to what happened during the time of Ned Stark's father, which is something that we don't look at huge amounts, but that I think set in place the events that led to Robert's rebellion. So uh, uh, I hope that one answers that that question. Um, uh, Sarah Sean Greenfield says, uh, "Do you think John and company will flee the North through the crypts?" Um, I think, um, I think probably probably not i think what may happen through the crypts is that bran might get to winterfell in the books through the crypts um uh we've not gone down to the bottom of the crypts they've not really talked about the bottom of the crypts on the show so i think that how they're going to use that is going to be largely based on what they have been telling us about the crypts so far and which has all been about liana uh, and about the, the fact that there's her statue there and they're always standing it next to it and talking to each other, the Starks are. Uh, so I think that is what the big reveal about the, uh, the, the crypts is going to be, rather than it being uh, a way of escape. They might do, I don't know, but um, I think it's more likely they're going to be using that as a mechanism through which to talk about John's true parentage. Um, uh, Lady Warrior uh, of House Tinfoil um, asking if Lyanna was put in the crypts because she was a princess slash queen since she married Rhaegar. Um, that's, uh, well, I, I think we need to be clear, and it's quite a, quite a technical distinction, but I think it's an important one. Uh, all the Starks were buried in the crypts. So it was not, it's, uh, the fact that Lyanna was buried in the crypts was not controversial in and of itself. So uh, we see uh, that this is something that 
uh, Bran thinks about. It's also something Arya uh, reminisces about in the books, the fact that she's already got a sarcophagus, which is set aside for her in the crypt. So she knows that that's where she's not lined up to be uh, the the ruler of, of, of Winterfell, but there's already a sarcophagus set aside for her. And so all of the Starks are buried in the crypts. The thing that was controversial was the fact that she had a statue of her. Now, this is not uh, the first time this has happened. There was a, uh, and I forget his name now, but two or three generations earlier, uh, one of the sort of the, a, a brother of, of uh, one of the Lords of Winterfell also got a statue for doing a great and courageous thing. So... I think that she got a statue probably for the reasons that we've heard, that Ned loved her and cared about her. I think that he also, there was also a statue of if its other brother, Brandon, there, so it's not it's not just about her. I don't think that he made a statue because she was uh, married to, to Rhaegar. I don't think that that's, uh, he would have viewed that as being a thing which meant that she was uh, important enough Stark to be, uh, guaranteed a, a statue. I, I honestly think it is just that he cares about his family. We see time and time again, uh, all of his decisions were about caring about his family. Um, incidentally, not just about him being a great honourable person. It's it's about uh, it's about family. Um, uh, okay, have I? Uh, I think I'm going to. Uh, uh, move on now from Winterfell. Um, uh, we're going to look at a few other things, but there were just a couple of things I wanted just at this point just to tell you about what's going on. Um, uh, first of all, if you weren't on this live stream last week, uh, then uh, you missed my announcement, uh, which is that I am going to be launching a second channel. Uh, the link for it, hopefully, I've put already down in the description below. Uh, it is going to be called The Well-Told Tale. I've set up the channel already. There's no content on it yet. But if you want to go over there and just have a quick look at it, if you want to subscribe as well, that would be absolutely amazing. Uh, so you're ready for when the, the content comes up. This is going to be uh, about me narrating stories. I'm going to be taking the, the best science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction stories ever written, uh, and I'm just going to be narrating them. And that's that's what the focus is. It's the thing that people have said to me most since I started doing this was that they wanted me to get more into uh, audio narration. So I thought, you know what, I'll do it. I'm setting this up as a podcast as well as a YouTube channel. They're going to be long form. So I'm going to make sure that they're going to be you know, at least half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour, depending on uh, what size fits the, the material. Uh, so they're going to be long episodes each time. Uh, one a week, I think probably every Wednesday, and we're going to be looking, doing some of the best uh, stories that I know of, things like The War of the Worlds, Frankenstein. I've got a few more excellent stories lined up that I'm going to be telling, uh, and they're going to be, while it's on, advert-free, so so you're not going to get interrupted by adverts halfway through me telling the story. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. I'm going to be launching it at the at probably towards the end of June, so in just under a month's time. So if you want to go over and subscribe, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, if you're as excited as I am and, and you're, you're already engaged in the channel and you want to support this, uh, you can do that as well. I've set up a GoFundMe page. Again, I've set up the link down below. That is to enable me to get the best quality audio equipment and and. Uh, hopefully some editing services of a professional audio editor to try and get the best quality stuff happening uh, right from the start. Uh, so uh, if that's something you're interested in, please uh, do check that out as well. Uh, so there's that, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but as always, I also want to say uh, a big thank you to my patrons. Um, uh, guys, I, I say it every time, I cannot do this without your support, and I am so appreciated, appreciative of it. Um, I also do need to apologise to you because uh, I I was just thinking earlier today about uh, the the most recent reading I did from the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter, and I just thought, oh, I didn't get I didn't get much feedback on that one, and then I suddenly realised I hadn't actually uploaded it. I've been I recorded it a couple of weeks ago for you, and then I completely forgot to upload it, and I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, 
within the next 24 hours. So that's going to be available for you uh, within the next 24 hours on, on my Patreon site. That's uh, an Ariane chapter who's a book character, not a show character, but she's a fantastic uh, and, and it's a really good little chapter. So uh, so I hope you like that. Uh, if if you are a regular viewer and you you might be interested in Patreon, uh, I've got a great community going over there. All my patrons uh, get priority in terms of questions for Q and A's like this, uh, and obviously uh, I chat to, to them over there as well. Um, and there are some uh, exclusive uh, bits of audio content that I produce just for my patrons. So if you're interested in that, please do check out my Patreon page. Again, a link down below. So that's enough of the uh, the adverts, guys. Um, let's get back to talking about the North. Um, uh, I think, uh, so I was going to sort of like sweep my way through um, uh, some of the, uh, although actually I've just noticed, Emmanuel Favutza, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Let's just do quickly do, uh, uh, I'll quickly answer that one before moving on to, I think I was going to go on to Bear Island next. So if you've got any Bear Island questions, then uh, uh, do come to that. Um, Manuel says, uh, if Ned arrived at the Tower of Joy alone, uh, it would end differently. The King's Guard wouldn't kill the Queen's brother. <coughs> I think uh, that's that's a very interesting question. It depends on what Ned's intentions were uh, and what he was wanting to do. So Ned uh, came there um, uh, with a group of people because he wanted to get access to his sister now he was willing to shed blood for it and if he was willing to shed blood for it when he came on his own then the situation would be the same but i think if he didn't have his companions particularly hal and reed uh we talked a bit about hal and reed last time but if he didn't have hal and reed then i don't think that he would have won uh because howland as um uh, as ned ad admitted uh if it hadn't been for Howland, then he would have lost uh, against Arthur Dane. Uh, he would, Arthur Dane would have killed him. So uh, it's not, I think, Emmanuel a matter of who he brought with him, but it was the uh, the approach that he took to that uh, it, that that thing. The King's Guard were there to protect uh, what they saw as being uh, the heir to the throne, uh, and they were going to stick by their promise to do that and if somebody came in who threatened in any way the heir to the throne uh then they would defend it now the logic there and again i'm going to try and cover all of this in in the videos that i'm going to start doing over the summer um the logic doesn't seem to make sense because if ned just came as you say if ned just came there and said hi i just want to see my sister uh, and i'm sure we can agree something that we can hide this uh, this child uh, let's all swear uh, an oath of silence then no bloodshed would have been needed but there was bloodshed there people did die uh, and that was because of the way he approached it i think um, not by because of who he had with him. Um, uh, I hope uh, I hope that one answers that one for you. Um, uh, Alison Mutlu, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Five dollars. Uh, congrats on the new channel. Thank you. I'm really excited about it, I, and I'm I'm bowled over by uh, by the the support I'm getting from other people uh, with this. Uh, let's start a donation train for Robert's new endeavor. Well, that'll be very kind. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Guys, I'm going to uh, I'm going to move on to um, Bear Island now. Uh, so Bear Island was something that uh, I was really looking forward to doing because we we only saw it very briefly on the show, uh, but uh, the way that it's described in the books, I think it did come across in the show as well. Is it's beautiful? This is a this is a thing that we we've not really thought about or, or, or discussed but it's uh um it's described as being this wonderfully almost kind of blissful place with uh with streams sort of tinkling down the hillside with with wonderful almost sort of alpine uh forests with 
with clear waters, uh, the, the, the deer gambling off in the distance. This is the way it's described as this wonderfully uh, idyllic uh, place to live, but incredibly cut off. It's, it, I, I said, I think quite a few times when I was doing the, the traveler's guide around the north, that it's the kind of place you only go if you're going there. But Bear Island really is. You, you only go there if you live there. It's not, uh, it's not en route to anywhere else because uh, you you could come down south and maybe go to Deepwood Mott, but that's pretty much it. Uh, and the people who live there tend to be born there, live there, and die there, and never really venture out. So uh, Joromamont and Diomamont were actually quite rare in the fact that they uh, left Bear Island. Most people just lived their lives there completely from from birth to death without, you know, they might visit the mainland once or twice, but without actually going very far. All of which led to Jura um, and his exile, because this was with his second wife, who was uh, a high tower, who was used to having uh, lots of entertainment and, and, and dancing and, and musicians. None of them ever came and visited uh, Bear Island. The, the, the food was very samey. It was, it was beautiful. It was idyllic, but it was dull. And so he, his descent, uh, and you know, he's not a blameless person in this clearly, but his descent was an attempt to uh, please this new wife uh, by paying ever more extravagantly for things to be brought in for her entertainment, for jewels and for other exciting things to, to go on. Um, and this bankrupt him, basically. And so that was that was the, uh, the, the path that he went down. And when he was trying to sell people off into slavery, it's because he was running out of money. And that meant that when he was caught, that Ned Stark came to do what Ned Stark was going to do, and that was obviously uh, he was going to behead him, so that's why he headed off and out and went off into exile. It was fundamentally because Bear Island was beautiful but boring. Uh, so uh, that's uh, sort of a potted history of where, where, where Jura Mormont uh, 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 came from. Um, let's have a quick look. Uh, scripts, uh, $10 again regarding the new channel. Uh, can you read any great children's books? Uh, would love to share that great voice with my grandson. Thank you. That's very kind. Uh, I did, I saw your, uh, your comment on my, uh, Patreon page and, and I was going to reply to you there, but I'm happy to hear. Yes, I'm very, uh, I, I will, I think, uh, find some, uh, some great, uh, children's stories as well perhaps uh, perhaps i'll do a couple of them for christmas or something like that that's that's uh, uh, that's something i think I'd, I'd very much enjoy uh to start with as i said i'm probably going to focus in on uh, public domain works simply because uh it, rather than sort of building up a war chest to pay for rights for things there are so many great stories um that are out there that that's uh, public domain that that we can read through to start with and then we can start moving on to uh, to a few more recent things but there that still leaves huge amounts of fantastic uh children's uh, stories so yes uh, i think i'm mostly going to be doing normal adult stories but yes i'm very happy to uh, to pick out a few children's stories and we'll uh, we'll come to them uh so uh let's just uh, have a quick flick through <coughs> um uh, scotty uh 16976 Jura's story sounds like a cover the same as john connington's uh yeah it could be i guess um uh the uh laura d says uh, do you think that there are shapeshifters from bear island um Again, it could be we've not heard of, of any specifically. They're obviously they're referred to as the bears. Uh, so you've got the, the little bear and all the rest of it. Um, but I, I don't think that they're shapeshifters. They could be, um, uh, and there may well be a, a couple there, but it's, it's called Bear Island because there are bears there, not because the people turn into bears. And um, 
so yes, I think the short answer is that there could be, but we're not specifically told that there are lots of shapeshifters there. Um, Uh, duh, 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 duh. graphics by kathy says don't take it wrong but you do have a beautiful bedtime story man <laughs> well thank you very much uh i will take that in the best way possible thank you um uh, there's a little bit of uh conversation still about the statues in uh winterfell crypts and i think Yes, there are no other w statues of women in Winterfell Crypts. That's that's very true. I, I think that so hers was the first uh, female statue because they were all the lords of Winterfell before that. So yes, but I don't think uh, it was the fact that she was female that was the specific um, cause of controversy. I think it was the fact that she wasn't uh, the lord, uh, if that makes sense. Now, obviously, they had a, a in, ingrained uh, sexism within the system uh, with male preference primogenitor, which meant that women could never be the lord of Winterfell. Um, uh, but that's a, probably a slightly wider issue here. It's, it's, I think the controversy was not the fact that she was a female. I think it was the fact that she was uh, 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 not the lord, uh, whereas... Brandon Stark, one could argue that perhaps he was the Lord for a few seconds because he died at pretty much the same time as his father, um, but she, it was never never the case. Um, uh, Monkeytron says, uh, is Jorah forgiven by um, uh, uh, Lyanna uh, or will he betray his family again? Um I think he may well be. Uh, so I, I think in the, in the short term, uh, and, and this is in, in the show, I, I've said it before, the first episode is just going to be this whole series of amazing um, uh, introductions at Winterfell. We, we're going to get um, uh, Daenerys meeting all of the Starks. Uh, we're going to get um, uh, uh, the... Uh, John coming back to be meeting uh, Sam again. We're going to have Bran meeting all these people, and then one of the ones which uh, which is going to be fascinating is is Lyanna Mormont and Jorah Mormont uh, when they meet. Will she forgive him? I don't know, uh, but I think that she will see the bigger picture and accept the fact that uh, any fighting that they need to do between them has to wait until after the wars. I think that that's where they're going to end up. And uh, I think that he will probably end up uh, either either dying, sadly, or being uh, forgiven by whoever, whichever lord slash ruler uh, emerges at the other side of it. So um, I don't know whether she will actually forgive him, but I think that she may well um, uh, overlook uh, his transgressions uh, in the short term. Um, think uh, so. Yeah, Dreamway Nine. Um, I would love if you'd read something by Neil Gaiman. I love Neil Gaiman. He, I, I'm a huge fan of Neil Gaiman. Um, I think, uh, as I said earlier, I think that the, in the short term, I'm going to be focusing on uh, things that are in the public domain. Neil Gaiman uh, works and not in the public domain, and they cost a lot of money to do uh, readings like this of them. So uh, I, I, hopefully at some point I will work up to the point where I can start uh, to be able to afford to do that. Uh, but in the short term, uh, then, yes, it's going to be focusing on on the many excellent public domain things that there are out there. But Neil Gaiman uh, will be probably one of the first people on my list of people to get when we've got the budget to be able to afford that kind of thing. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, made sense. Um, Laura D says, I shudder to think what Leanna Mormont will say when she finds out about Danny and John, as well as who he really is. However, she did say, I don't care if he's a bastard. Yeah, this is very true. So um, uh, <coughs> she, uh, she accepted, I mean, if you look back at what her words were, she accepted it 
him as king of the north because or proposed him as king of the north because ned stark's blood flowed in his veins and so actually on the technically it doesn't yes he is part stark but he's not ned stark's son uh, so uh, she will probably be as with the rest of the northern lords slightly taken aback by this i think that there's going to be quite a lot of consternation about that about um whether or not he should be the lord of winterfell whether he should be the king of the north um but i think this will all get shut down when the army of the dead arrives when the the white walkers arrive so it's uh it, it it's something which will cause a huge amount of and episode one is going to be a huge amount of uh humans arguing with each other trying to figure out what's going on with the backdrop of of the the night king marching ever southwards um okay guys so i'm going to move down to uh just a couple more areas i want to do uh one of them is going to be uh white harbor now uh white harbor um i mentioned a bit before is it's the only city in the north and it's probably the least northern feeling of all of the the northern uh, uh, settlements. It it's relatively I mean, it's it's old when there's a part of it, um, the Wolf's Den, uh, which is the it used to be the castle. It's been turned into a prison. That's old. Uh, there's an even older bit just out in the harbour on the top of the rock. There's a, a sort of some fortifications by the first men, um, but the city is actually relatively new. Uh, it's within the last few hundred years it's actually blossomed and grown into the city that is there now and it's unlike most of the northern cities it's not focused on how do we defend ourselves against the cold it's there it's built in quite a uh, a grid system straight roads rather than just sort of like making the most of the the geography it's not got this organic feel that uh, winterfell does it's it's all uh, designed to look good. The buildings are all whitewashed. They're all looking in the same kind of color. So it's just it's an attempt to make the place look nice. There are courtyards. There are uh, uh, fountains. Uh, the 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 main stairway that runs uh, from the top from the the new castle at the top of the hill all the way down to the harbour that's got these beautiful statues with lights next to it so it's it's a deliberate attempt to make a nice in their world modern city um, and it's not it doesn't feel northern because the Mandalays who were the uh, the the ruling house there they were not a northern ruling house they were brought in from the south by the Starks who said um, and I won't go into the story now but if you look at my White Harbour uh, video and then I explain it there uh, but they uh, they were homeless and the Stark said hey why don't you take over White Harbour and you can if you swear loyalty to us you can rule that uh, uh, as that port town and the, the Mandalays arrived with a lot of money and they turned this into the most prosperous place in the entire north. So the Mandalays on the show aren't mentioned as much as some of the other northern houses, but they are the richest northern house. They control the access to the north because uh, this is where this is the only major harbour in the north, White Harbour. This is where everything gets funneled into the, the biggest, the, the major river in the north, uh, the White Knife, which heads all the way up towards uh, the centre of the north, towards uh, Winterfell. Um, and so they control the trade, and it's a lot more of a cosmopolitan feel to it as a city. There are lots of people from the south, as well as other countries who've come in there, lots of different goods. Uh, and lots of different languages spoken and it's also a place where the worship of the old gods is a minor religion this is a place where the faith of the seven has taken hold so that's what we're that's what we're looking at it's a very different feel to it but it's a very loyal out of all of the the um the houses it's one of the most loyal to house stark uh, in the books it seems that they're the center of this 
uh, grand northern conspiracy to get the Starks back into power, uh, secretly working behind the scenes to try and uh, oust the Boltons. So um, why Harper is different, uh, uh, but it's uh, still very loyal to the Starks. Um, uh, Crips of Winterfell scripts uh, uh, on Patreon uh, says that he'd love to hear what I think will happen at White Harbor in the next season. Will it be important or merely a drop-off point? I think uh, on the show we've not really made it on White Harbor, so I think that we're looking at it, at it as a drop-off point. So this is where, if you remember, uh, the the boat with with John and Danny and Tyrion on. Uh, that is going up from um, from Dragonstone all the way up to White Harbor. And the idea being that they stop off there and then they get some horses and they head north uh, from there, rather than just Danny getting on the back of a dragon and just flying all the way up to Winterfell. They were going to get to Winterfell via White Harbor. So th there may be a scene or two there, but I think that it's really uh, the action is going to happen when they get up to Winterfell rather than at White Harbor. There aren't masses of characters that we know who are in White Harbor, so I think they'll just move on from that, unfortunately, um, save themselves a bit of money on building a new set, I guess. Um, <clears throat> okay, guys, I'm just I'm going to see if there's any questions in here about uh, White Harbor. Um, uh, the Mandalays have managed to port before they knew how to build and maintain one. Yeah, absolutely. So they turned they turned it into uh, away from what was just a defensive structure. Effectively, when they took it on, the Starks told them that they wanted them to be defending the mouth of the White Knife River, uh, which is effectively what it, it was there to do originally. And the Mandalays did. That's exactly what they did. But they didn't just. Uh, build up the defenses and make sure that it was it was hard to attack. They also they used their money to build a city and actually make a prosperous um, uh, uh, place in the north, uh, which people hadn't done before. The north doesn't trade much with the outside world. They they create what they need to get them through each winter, and that's pretty much it. So there's not huge amounts of trade until the Mandalays came in, and that was what facilitated it all. Uh, so, yes, uh, very much so. They they definitely knew how to do it. Um, talented bakers in White Harbor, yes, and brewers as well, uh, and silversmiths. They have a lot of things going on there uh, in uh, in White Harbor. Um, uh, Laura D talking about the crypts. Yeah, I agree. It has got a major part to play there. Um, uh, uh, Wolf's Den, it's the Marriott of the North, just ask Davos. Yes, this is a reference to, um, and Kelly Lausman also asked about my theories on the Wolf's Den. So th the Wolf's Den uh, was what I said, it was the original castle, as it were, for defending the, the, the mouth of that river, a strategically important river uh, for protecting the North. So that was what was bequeathed to the Mandalays. Now, it's in, whereas most of the city is in this kind of white, it's very dark, it's very black, um, and it's it was turned from being a castle into being a prison. And in the books, Davos has gone on a slightly different path, and he, uh, he was out looking for, um, uh, uh, for Rickon Stark. He ended up being imprisoned in uh, White Harbor. The Mandalays uh, imprisoned him in White Harbor in the Wolf's Den. But it so soon turned out that this wasn't just a normal uh, imprisonment. Um, they faked his death. They, they made it look like they had killed him. Uh, uh, and he was treated actually very well. There's uh, there's some wonderful uh, chapters there of the all of the the characters that are there serving him in um, in the wolf's den, and we see that it's uh, it retains a lot of the sort of it was a castle, but that's where people lived. So there's some 
actually quite nice living quarters. Uh, there's a, a nice fireplace. He gets reasonable food. Uh, so it's quite a it's quite a, a good place for him. We see there's also there's a weirwood tree in there as well, as, as there is so many of these ancient places, a weirwood tree which has sort of outgrown uh, its surroundings. And as with this feeling we get from a lot of the north where it's not perhaps as well maintained as it could have been, that has got branches breaking through uh, different windows and, and 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 roots that sort of are descending down into the building as well. So um, uh, Kelly Lousman saying, what are my theories about the wolf's den? I think the wolf's den is what we think it is. Uh, I think it's an ancient first men stronghold, which was built. And the, the Mandalays who have come in haven't got all that heritage. They were descended from the first men, but they weren't northerners. Uh, and so as soon as they could, they built their own nice shiny castle on the top of the hill. Um, they didn't want to get rid of the old thing because it was it was quite useful. Um, uh, but at the same time, it wasn't the centerpiece for them anymore. So that's what that's what I think is going on with the Wolf's Den. It's a fascinating place. Um, um, and it was as as its history the reason why it went to the mandalays was that uh it, it was past the starks gave it to lots of different people to like their uh, brothers and cousins within the starks and then they tried a few other northern families and it nothing seems to work they either lost it a couple of them actually rose up in rebellion against the starks and it was uh it was only when they brought the mandalays in that it actually stayed loyal for a long time um uh, Christopher Mitchell says, who thinks that Davos is not Davos? Um, I think Davos is Davos. Um, uh, I, I haven't seen any convincing evidence that he's not who he says he is, I have to say. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Kelly Lassman, I think I answered that one about uh, the Wolf's Den. Um, White Harbour was gifted. Yes, it was gifted. Um, uh, and I think that's the questions there on White Harbour. So I think um, uh, somebody's saying there's a small occasional cracking sound in the audio. Apologies if that's uh, that's a few of you are getting that. Um, that could either be uh, a really annoying Windows update that I got the other day, which is uh, causing me huge amounts of trouble uh, uh, that you don't really need to know about, but I th I thought I'd got it sorted. Uh, or it might be the fact that it's tipping down with rain outside, and that's what you can hear. So uh, apologies if the audio quality isn't as good as normal today, but uh, hopefully it will be uh, better very soon. Um, uh, Monkey Tron just saying, where did you get the Mandley info? Uh, World of Ice and Fire. Yeah, it's from it's from all over the place. Um, uh, I don't I don't tend to just sort of follow one thing. The World of Ice and Fire has got a lot of good uh, background information. Uh, I would highly recommend you uh, look for that. Um, uh, but also just simply reading the the books um, uh, a few times. You there, there's a lot of extra information going on there. Uh, so uh, that's where I've, I've got it from. Um, uh, Yensid, uh, no question, but a super chat. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm going to move on now to the last bit of the north that I want to talk about, which is the neck. Now, the neck, there are two specific bits here that I was going to talk about. Uh, one of them is Moat Kalin. We've talked about it a little bit already. Um, uh, but it is probably the most strategically important castle in the north in that it is uh, that the neck is all this boggy swampland with just one causeway going through the middle of it and Moat Kalin sits on that causeway so if you're going to get overland any army north you have to go through Moat Kalin but as we said it has gone into disrepair and when, when I mean disrepair significant disrepair it used to be a massive fortress now there's just all the walls have gone pretty much apart from a few little bits here and there and there are just three towers standing apart from one another um, that are all leaning at various angles as if they're all about to fall into the ground and get sucked in because the, the impression uh, when it's written the description is very much it's kind of like 
all the stones are slowly sinking into the bog uh, around it. So it's, I, I call it a fortress, it's just three towers now, uh, but it's been made very clear that because of its positioning, if you hold those three towers, then you can cause an immense amount of damage to anyone attacking uh, or coming from the south. Um, the rest of the neck is this boggy swampland uh, that legend has it was created when the, the children of the forest cast the hammer of the waters, this great spell, in an attempt to flood all of the neck to break off the north from the, the rest of Westeros to try and prevent the, the northward expansion of humans. Uh, they didn't quite get it right, they just made the place really swampy, not, uh, they didn't actually manage to sort of break it apart. But what that has meant is that the neck now is impassable other than this one causeway. And uh, as I say, I'm going to, the, 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 we're going to be in the neck and uh, heading towards Greywater to watch in the next Traveller's Guide tomorrow. But um, the, uh, the, the feel of it that I'd want to get across to you is the fact that this is not just uh, this kind of uh, place that you can easily navigate your way through in any way. The only people who can do that are the Kranach men who live there. Uh, the, there are animals living there there's there are snakes there's also these creatures called lizard lions uh who appear to be sort of crocodiles or alligators uh that that, that are there uh if you take a wrong step then there's quicksand which is sucks you down into it uh so there's all these dangers around you added to which the 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 scenery the geography shifts around as you as you're uh, as, as you walk along, it's uh, things don't stay still. The Cranags are actually literally just sort of like small islands that are drifting around in this bogland, in this swampland. And the Cranag men build their houses on these islands and then they shift and move around with the currents. And that's what Greywater Watch is it is a castle which is on a Cranag which is moving around on the water all the time. And so this is why ravens, for example, can't find it because it's never in the same place. So the uh, one of the questions we had earlier was about whether there are any more children of the forest. And I said, possibly in the neck because this is one of the few places where they could actually hide and people wouldn't be able to find them. The Kranag men may come across them, but uh, no other humans will ever go there because they simply do not survive. Um, so uh, that was one I, I wanted to say there. I'm just going to have a quick look to see if there's any uh, particular questions about this. Um, in the chat, I can't. Uh, Q&A, who built Moat Kaylin? Uh, Kelly Lousman. Um, and why would the Children of the Forest do the Hammer of the Waters from the Children's Tower? Now, this is a... Uh, a I agree. These, these, are, these are good questions, and the honest answer is that we do not know exactly. So it was built by the first men. This, this was a human construction. Um... Uh, the the children's tower is one of the three remaining towers. It's a very tall, thin tower. And apparently they uh, cast the Hammer of Waters from the top of this. Now, uh, the only answer that we can come up with is the fact that the, the people who owned it were the Kranach men. So this was like House Reed and the other houses uh, amongst the Kranach men. And they were close to the children of the forest. So perhaps, perhaps they thought, you know what, if what they're trying to do to prevent this, this war from carrying on is to break apart these two land masses, then that's actually fine. Uh, so we don't know huge amounts about what happened at that time, but I can see it being eminently possible that the Kranag men actually were 
either siding with or sympathetic to the children of the forest, which is why they would allow them to use their castle to do that. But uh, it's all speculation. We simply do not know. It, we're, we're told that this is a first men construction, and that seems entirely right because the children of the forest, as far as we can tell, don't build castles at all. Uh, so it does seem to be there. It does seem to have been uh, owned and manned by uh, the Kranig men for most of its existence. So it makes sense that they were there at the time. Uh, and we're told that the Kranig men uh, were close to the children of the forest. So again, that makes sense. So what we have is something that seems likely, uh, but we don't know for certain uh, about those uh, exact um uh the the exact order of events there uh the uh mew mew ninja's gonna potato great name by the way says the picture behind you looks as though there's a fox face in the middle of it uh that's this picture it's actually and i know it's a little bit far away it's actually a westworld picture all the way around the outside are lots of different westworld characters and in the middle for those who uh watch it that's actually uh, Child Ford with uh, um, uh, a host version of Child Ford with, you can see the inner workings uh, with the head has pulled back, which was uh, something we saw back in season one. So that's what that is. It's not a fox, I'm afraid. It's uh, it's actually a really good picture um, uh, by uh, Vanessa Cole, if you've ever come across her, who's one of the, the main writers on both uh westworld watchers and watchers on the wall uh, she's an excellent artist who um i would highly recommend you go and check out uh, she does some fantastic uh, um pictures not just westworld but also a lot of game of thrones ones so do do check that out um that's i'm just seeing um could moat caitlin have been there before this is Devi saying before the hammer of the waters yes uh the legends are that the hammer of the waters was cast from moat caitlin uh caitlin caitlin um uh benny seanfield sup robert hi there benny good to see you um uh monkey tron says will the neck stop the white walkers temporarily or will it fail pathetically um i think that they will just head on through down the causeway i think that's that's what they would do if they're heading down south um uh ned always said emmanuel Favitza, that with a few hundred men you, you can defend against the whole Lannister drama yeah so uh this is uh mate kaylin as i say it's it's a, a defensive stronghold because of its positioning each of the the three towers that are there remaining uh they're they're far enough apart that they're not joined up, so you have to attack them separately, but they're also within uh, bow and arrow range. So uh, if you attack one of them and you can only attack from certain angles because you can't get lost in the bog because you get caught up in the quicksand and have the lizard lions attacking you, you have to attack in certain ways. Every way you could possibly attack those three towers from, you will come under a hail of arrows from the other towers. So that's why... Uh, it was said not not just by Ned, but by a few different people that uh, you could defend against an army with your quite a small number of people. Um, uh, could the neck, this is Karth saying, could the neck have anything to do with the Valonqar prophecy? Um, uh, so the, this is the, the Valonqar prophecy given to Cersei about... Um, the Valonqar will wrap his hands around your uh, your neck. Now, I, I think the short answer is I don't think so. But uh, the the show did a, a really interesting nod to this, and whether it was intentional or unintentional, I don't know. But uh, last season, when that there was that wonderful map of Westeros uh, on the floor. Uh, down in King's Landing, and Cersei and Jamie were talking to each other on it. Uh, that one of the promo pictures had Cersei standing on the neck and Jamie standing on the fingers, uh, which uh, fueled many people thinking, "Ah, is this a hint towards the Velancar prophecy?" Because many people, including incidentally myself, think that Jamie will be the one to kill Cersei in the end. 
Uh, and is this a hint with him being with the fingers and her on the neck that he would uh, eventually be the person to to wrap his hands or his hand around uh, around her neck? Possibly, uh, but I don't think that it's it's a specific um, uh, thing within that uh, particular prophecy. Um, uh kathy says get a mac <laughs> Th thank you uh i may well do at some point uh um okay so i'm thinking um uh freemius b says why jamie i did a video on this uh ages ago uh um called something like uh, will jamie kill cersei something quite simple as that uh for me it's about the character arcs and and there's a huge amount of foreshadowing about the fact that they again say uh, say again and again they say we came into this world together we'll leave this world together so i think that the feeling for them is that they will both die at the same time and uh, you have to ask who is it who she would allow into that those close quarters with her I think that's quite a small number of people. And I think that his character arc is very much along the lines of moving from him being completely obsessed with her and doing exactly what she wants, moving uh, to the point where he breaks free from it until eventually he realises that um, uh, not only does he not love her, but she's also a huge risk. And that time that... that um, molded him like no other when he broke his his vows uh, uh as as kingsguard and killed the king because the king was about to burn down the city uh, i can see cersei at the very end looking to do something equally dramatic and jamie finding it within himself to do the same thing so i think that it thematically it ends that way for both of them i think that's where where the story goes other people could kill her but i don't think for any of them it's it would be such a satisfying end to their story uh arcs um uh and fumish b just answering that saying it's a step backwards for him it, it may well be but i think that this it, it's it depends on how you view it. you could say it's a step backwards or you could say it's his story arc coming full circle back to who he was when he was being most truly himself uh, which was the person who didn't care about what other people thought about him. He was doing the right thing, which was preventing the deaths of thousands of innocent people in King's Landing. And if he get if he does that again, then I think that shows the the quality of his character uh, has actually um, uh, stuck all the way through. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to start um, uh, drawing this one uh, to a close now. Uh, the the overall thought that I would just want to to sort of say is that the North is uh, an incredibly diverse place. That uh, that when we we're going through with the the Traveler's Guide, then it was um, it was noticeable that there were mountains, there were uh, uh, islands cut off the, from the, the 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 rest of it the north there were the bigger forests than anywhere else in westeros there was the biggest uh, swamp lands in the entirety of westeros uh, there were huge swathes of land where there was nobody there at all there were lowlands this is an incredibly diverse place geographically uh, but the people themselves are united by uh, with small exceptions that we've covered a moment ago, united by this uh, ancient history that they've had. And the I think the, the, the teaser here is about the North remembering. And this is a thing that uh, I, I came back to when I was, I, was, I was thinking about the North. The North clearly does not remember. The thing at a very basic level that, that it seems that they were supposed to remember was what they were protecting against. They were protecting against the another attack from the north, from the White Walkers, and they have forgotten. They've forgotten. They've allowed the wall, the Night's Watch, to dwindle away as a force. They have allowed their defences to be uh, falling into ruin. 
uh, and they've they've allowed, uh, as we saw um, both in the show and in the books, the Starks to leave Winterfell when the, having the Starks at Winterfell is crucial to protection of the North. So the North has not remembered is the the, the short answer, and uh, as a result, when the the forces start to attack them from both sides, that's they're hitting them at the worst possible point because they do not remember either what the threat is or what they have to do to protect themselves. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap that up there. Thank you so much. There's been some really good questions there in the chat. Thank you so much, particularly for the super chats. Uh, apologies if I didn't get to your question. Uh, uh, there were a lot of really good questions coming in and, and I didn't get a chance to, to go through all of them. Uh, as I said, if you're at all interested in supporting this channel, getting access to uh, to more of my content, please do check out the link to my Patreon page, which is down there, or also the new channel, The Well-Told Tale. Uh, again, my link is down there below. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, the next episode of The Traveler's Guide will be out tomorrow. I'll be back here uh, same time next week for another live stream uh, on Game of Thrones uh, and also over the weekend for Westworld. Take care, guys, and I shall see you all very soon.